Okay, I'll begin with the homage to the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo Discussing Sutta number 53 in the Machima Nikaya. This is called the Seka Sutta. This is the discourse on the disciple in higher training. And last time, let's see, we got through paragraph 10, section 10 on gratefulness. And so now we come to section number 11. This is going to be on the seven good qualities. So we have to remember now that in this uh, sutta, the Buddha, or actually the Venerable Ananda is discussing the Seka. This means a disciple who has gained the initial breakthrough to the truth of the Dhamma. And so this kind of disciple acquires access to the full Noble Eightfold Path and all of the other 37 Bodhi, Bodhipakki Adhamas, the factors which are the aids to enlightenment. So now, this, because this disciple has the vision or the insight into the ultimate truth of the Dhamma, he could never fall back or regress. But in order to progress onwards to the final aim of the Dhamma, he has to cultivate a number of factors or qualities. And so Ananda is explaining the kind of training or practice this disciple undergoes in order to reach the final goal in this very life itself. Okay, so just to review some of the qualities we've already covered, so this disciple, actually the text itself gives a summary or kind of a outline of the qualities in paragraph 6. The noble disciple is possessed of virtue. That means the disciple follows the rules of training, the principles of ethical or moral training. Then the disciple guards the doors of the sense faculties in order to prevent the mind from grasping and becoming carried away with pleasant and unpleasant objects of the senses. The disciple is moderate in eating, taking the right amount of food to maintain the health and strength of the body, but not overeating in order to indulge the craving for taste and thereby to ruin his health and to fall into drowsiness and laziness. And then the disciple undertakes the practice of wakefulness, and this means the very diligent practice of meditation throughout the day, with just the period of rest at night. Okay, so now we come to paragraph 11, which is going to explain what are called the seven good qualities and actually the word that's translated as good qualities is sad dhamma.
Yeah, so actually the word saddhamma, sometimes if it's a singular, it means the good dharma, the good teaching of the Buddha. But we have this form, saddhamma, with the plural. Actually, I think most of them have the uh, chart on the jhanas. Anybody need the table on the jhanas? If you do, just raise your hand high. If you raise your hand, it makes it easy for IT to find it. Okay, so Sattama in the, you see the word Dhamma, on the one hand it has the meaning of teaching, on the other it has the meaning of quality or factor or element. And so here it has the meaning Sattama as seven qualities. Dhamma is quality and Sat or Sat means the good, the good or even saintly person. And so these seven good qualities are faith, what's called hiri, translated here as shame, otapa, the fear of wrongdoing, learning, energy, mindfulness, and wisdom. Okay, so one begins with faith or sada. So sada is the quality by which one, what I say that one commits oneself to the Buddha, the Dharma, uh, the Sangha, and the training. And what is the special object of faith, as described here, is the enlightenment of the Buddha. It's not so much faith in the Buddha just as an individual person, but in the Buddha as the one who has reached the full enlightenment. And so we have the description here of faith. Here a noble disciple has faith. He places faith in the Tathagata or Buddha's enlightenment. Thus, that the Blessed One is the accomplished one or the Arahat, the one who is fully liberated, the one who is fully enlightened to all the principles, all the truths, of the spiritual life, the one who is accomplished in true knowledge and conduct, the fortunate one, here it's rendered sublime, the one who has reached the true goal, the knower of the worlds. Then we come to four qualities that highlight the Buddha's ability to teach others. He is the incomparable leader. It's actually, literally, it's sarati, which means chariot driver. So the chariot driver has to tame the horses and the Buddha tames not horses but people to be tamed or to be trained. He is the Sattva Deva Manusana, the teacher of the devas or deities and of human beings. He is Bhutto, which means or suggests both the, the one who is himself enlightened and also bodhita, the one who enlightens others, who conveys the truth of enlightenment to others. And then he is blessed, it's actually it's not such a good translation, because it suggests that somebody has blessed him, but rather it means he is the one who is endowed with all noble or lofty qualities, which he's perfected over many, many lifetimes. And so one places this trust, confidence or faith in the Buddha so that this faith in the Buddha acts as one's inspiration, 
one spur to development, and also it means that one fully trusts the Buddha as the guide along the path. The second of the good qualities, here it's translated as shame, but I want to take the Pali word, which is, has a more precise meaning. Somehow I think the word shame gets a little bit mixed with the connotations that it picks up from the Western Judeo-Christian heritage, which is not at all intended here. What is meant by hiri, I call this the inner monitor, or maybe you could even call it the voice of conscience, which when one is tempted to do something which is unwholesome or ethically inappropriate, it's that inner voice that tells you this kind of deed is wrong. If you engage in such a deed, such an action, or such thoughts, you're in a way um, staining the inherent or potential dignity of yourself as a noble person. We don't, maybe we can call Harry also the voice or sense of self-respect that it tells you that to indulge in such unwholesome actions would be a sign of almost an expression of disrespect to yourself. So out of respect for oneself, one refrains from any kind of unwholesome or inappropriate action. And one does so with the sense that it is in this way, by living up to high ethical standards, that one enhances one's sense of inner dignity, that one preserves one's self-respect, that one unfolds the potential nobility of one's person. Now the counterpart of Hiri the two go together very closely, is the next quality of the good persons, which is in Pali, otapa, which comes from the root tap, which means to burn or to suffer. And so otapa, we could say, means something like moral dread, and it's the reluctance to do anything that's wrong or unwholesome out of a fear of the consequences or dread of the consequences of those actions. And so, Ot. Okay. Otapa functions by in times of temptation, enticement, reminding one that if you are engages in such actions, it's possible that others will find out about it and then blame you and criticize you. And then you have to face all of the embarrassment, humiliation of being blamed and criticized by others. And especially in these days, you know, with, with the internet, you know, one little slip up, especially if you're a prominent person, and oh, everybody knows about it. Like just this past week, this director of the international IMF, International, international Monetary Fund, you know, two weeks ago he's sitting on the top of the world, now he's sitting, <coughs> oh, he's still sitting there, I guess he gets released on Bell. He was in a prison in Rikers Island <laughs> with uh, all these handcuffs around him. And another man was he I'm not quite following. His did he leave his position as governor of California? 
He, he's finished already, isn't he? Yes. So he was replaced by Terry Brown already, right? Yes. Somehow I got the impression from one article that I read that he was coming to the end of his term. But okay, a couple of weeks ago he was like one of the most powerful, famous, highly regarded people in the country. Now everybody is looking at him as a renegade, so to speak. It's a kind of rascal, you know, we have obnoxious, arrogant rascal, which is... <laughs> Okay, so this is one of the consequences, you know, blame, criticism from others. And it has to be criticism of good people, not, you know, if you're being criticized by uh, bad people for not engaging in bad actions. One shouldn't be worried about that. Okay, then another type of consequences are legal repercussions of bad actions. And then there are the karmic consequences of those actions, the type of consequence that we can't immediately see, but if we have trust in the law of karma, then we know that if we indulge and or get engage in unwholesome actions, we are creating unwholesome karma, which is going to rebound upon ourselves and bring us pain and suffering in the future. Okay, so these are some of the consequences of unwholesome action which should engender in us a kind of dread or fear which will serve as a motivation for restraint. And so these two, Hiri and Otapa, the sense of moral shame and the fear of consequences, fear of wrongdoing, work together. So in some people, one is more prominent in other people, the other is more prominent. I guess it depends on whether one is a more introverted type of person. In that case, the sense of hearing or of moral shame is more prominent. If one is a more extroverted, outward-going person, then otapa, the sense of moral dread, fear of wrongdoing, is more prominent. Maybe I'll just ask briefly whether there's any questions on these two qualities. Okay, then we'll move on to the next one. Okay, this is what is called learning. And so it's expected that the disciple who is cultivating the path will be one who has learned much of the Dhamma. And maybe it's probably appropriate that Venerable Ananda is the one who's giving this discourse. Even though the Buddha himself originally grouped together these seven good qualities, but Ananda is the one who is best known for his learning of the Dhamma. So Ananda says, he is one who has learned much, remembers what he has learned, and consolidates or stores up what he has learned. Such teachings as are good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, teachings with the right meaning or right goal and with the right phrasing, which are correctly expressed and which affirm or which declare the utterly perfect and pure holy life or spiritual life. Such teachings as these he has learned much of, remembered or retained in mind, recited verbally, investigated with the mind, and penetrated well by view. When you're reading this casually on your own, you might just come across these five terms and just sort of sweep them all in just very quickly. But if we actually focus on their precise meaning, we could say that these five terms are set out in this particular sequence because what they're actually sketching here is a kind of program of education or learning. I call this the curriculum in the Buddha Dhamma. Or maybe it's like the five steps of learning in the Buddha Dhamma. So first it says that these teachings of the good, good Dharma, one has learned much of, 
and the Pali has literally, one has heard much of. Because in the Buddha's day, the Dhamma teachings weren't written down. So in order to learn them, one has to go to listen to Dhamma talks, Dhamma discourses. And so one has to listen and listen very carefully. And then to get an abundance of teachings, one has to listen to many teachings. Okay, then when one listens to them, one listens attentively, carefully, and then one has to train the memory to retain them in mind. You know, somebody, in fact, there are many people who go to many different Dhamma talks. Ah, last week I went to hear Dalai Lama. Oh, next week I'm going to hear this one. Oh, I'm going to this center, that center, that center. Then you ask them, well, can you enumerate the five aggregates? Um, uh, let's see. Attention. <laughs> Can you enumerate the five precepts? Let's see. Watch as much TV as you want. <laughs> Sleep as long as you want. Eat a lot of junk foods. <laughs> no, those are not the five precepts. <laughs> okay, so you have to retain them in mind and I have to say, we're spoiled, I'm spoiled too, because, you know, we have books, printed books, and so we think, um, you know, we don't really have to preserve it in mind, just whenever I want, I just make a little note in the book, or maybe I put one of these little colored tabs, and so when I want to get the information, I just go to the book and open it up, and boom, there, there it is. But in the Buddha's day, even today it's actually done, you know, the monks who want to really learn the Dhamma very well, they practice memorization. And there are monks in Burma, actually, who have the whole Tripitaka by memory. And they just memorize, they take the texts, and then they, they practice from the time they're young. So the mind is very malleable and flexible and agile, and so they can pick up this information and impress it on the memory. Somebody like me, I have to even <laughs> write down my own telephone number <laughs> to make sure I get it right. <laughs> With a zip code number's number. <laughs> Maybe because the four digits of my telephone number and this second four digits of the zip code number are just the same numbers that are scrambled in a different order. So the telephone is 3624, the zip is 3426. <laughs> <laughs> so to avoid a mix-up, I have to write them down. <laughs> okay, but as one practices, one finds, you know, memorizing texts, you find that the mind starts gaining a certain strength in its capacity to, to rep, retain information. I used to do this like long ago, I used to practice memorizing some text, and at the beginning it was so difficult. You just have to go over again and again and again, even the simplest little text. But then after one practices, it's a little bit like developing a skill of maybe, maybe playing tennis or lifting weights. You know, if you begin trying to lift up, when you begin weightlifting, even a fairly light weight, it's so difficult to lift. But as one practices, one gets stronger and stronger, then one can start lifting heavier and heavier weights. And so in this way, we have these monks who are able to memorize the whole Tripitaka. Okay, so when 
remembers the teaching, retains them in mind, and then to help preserve them in memory, to get familiar with them, what one does is to recite them verbally. And so this is the practice for retaining the teaching in mind, for impressing it upon the mind, is to recite it over and over so, and keep on reciting texts that one has learned so that one doesn't forget them. So this is a practice common in Buddhist monasteries in Asia. I spoke last week about the walkway, the chakama, which is located outside the cottage or hut in which the monks live. And so sometimes the monks use the walkway, not just for doing the walking meditation, but when they're trying to memorize the text, what they do is to walk back and forth along the walkway, reciting the text verbally to themselves. You know, if you just sit down trying to recite the text, sometimes one gets restless and, you know, what's on TV tonight? <laughs> but if one is walking back and forth, you know, somehow the energy involved in walking back and forth, or maybe it's the rhythm and the recitation, the rhythm of the walking and the rhythm of the recitation synchronize and so it sustains one's effort to continue reciting the text. Okay, so this is a way of, we say, building up an arsenal of information, listening or learning many teachings, bearing them in mind, reciting them verbally. But that isn't enough in the Buddha's system of education but one has to go on to the next step, which is investigating the teachings with the mind. That is, one has to examine the teachings in order to draw out their meaning, to see what are the implications of the teachings, to see how maybe the teachings of this sutta correspond to the teachings of that sutta, how the different teachings fit together into a coherent whole. And one also investigates questionable points, like what is the exact meaning of this? Could this be in contradiction with that? How do you bring these two points together? And so this is like a whole sphere of education, is learning the meaning, investigating the meaning, and developing what I would call a coherent, comprehensive grasp of the organic unity of the teachings as a whole. The ability to see the implications, the ramifications, the um, applications of the teaching. And then based on this, this phase of training is primarily cognitive or intellectual, largely conceptual, but then one has to move on to the fifth stage, which is penetrating the teachings clearly, thoroughly, by view, which means gain, gaining actual insight into the teachings, through, especially through practice, through practice of meditation. Okay, so all of this comes together under the heading of learning. Okay, next we have two qualities which also go together in generally in the practice of meditation. Okay, or we could say more broadly in mental training. So one is energy, so here one is energetic in abandoning unwholesome states, unwholesome mental qualities, and in undertaking and developing wholesome states, wholesome qualities. One is steadfast, you know, persistent, firm in striving, and not remiss in developing wholesome 
states awesome qualities. One is not negligent or uh, heedless, but one is heedful, energetic, diligent. So this energy actually goes together very closely with what other phase of the training that we've already mentioned last week. Something I spoke about last week. It's one of the previous factors. disciple purifies his mind of obstructive states. It's wakefulness, right? So when one is energetic, then one is working to abandon these unwholesome states and to develop wholesome states. And basically that's what one is doing, one is devoted to wakefulness. And then this energy works together with mindfulness. And this is a little puzzling, I have to say, the explanation of mindfulness here. Okay, this is in paragraph 16, the text says, here the disciple has mindfulness, he possesses the highest mindfulness and skill, he recalls and recollects what was done long ago and spoken long ago. Now the word, Pali word mindfulness is sati. And the word sati comes from the verb sarati, which means to remember. And in common Indian usage, even at the time of the Buddha, the word sati was used in the sense of memory or recollection. But the Buddha took the word sati and then gave it a new meaning in his teaching, which means not so much remembering the past, but you could say remembering the present. We could say keeping the present in mind, remembering to keep one's mind in the present, not letting the mind slip off into stray thoughts about the past or hopes and fears about the future, but maintaining an awareness of the present. And so that is the meaning of sati, normal meaning in relation to meditation practice, particularly in relation to satipatthana, the, <coughs> the four establishments of mindfulness. And so when practicing the four establishments of mindfulness, one is aware or mindful of what is occurring in the body, one is mindful of whatever feelings are arising, one is mindful of states of mind, and one is mindful of the different factors or aspects of the teaching that one can recognize in one's experience. Okay, so that is the special meaning of sati that the Buddha gave gave to the word, which is somewhat different from the meaning of sati in ordinary discourse, where it means remembrance of the past. But also it seems sometimes the Buddha uses the word sati also in the sense of remembrance of the past, probably because when one is attentive to the present, keeping the present experience fully in mind, then it improves one's memory 
on later occasions so that one could recollect at a later time what is occurring now. And so perhaps this is why in this place mindfulness is explained as the ability to recall and recollect what was done and spoken long ago. But I think in the actual practice of meditation, then energy goes together with mindfulness, not so much in the sense of remembrance of the past, but in the sense of the clear, vivid awareness of what is occurring in the present. And so when mindfulness and when energy and mindfulness work together, then what is energetic, I say, what is energetically attending to the present. And as one attends energetically to the present, what is becomes able to see more and more precisely at subtle levels what is actually occurring in one's own bodily and mental experience. And what this eventually uncovers or exposes is the arising and passing away of all phenomena of experience, all the constituents of experience. So in this way, the practice, the diligent practice of energy and mindfulness give rise to the seventh quality, good quality, which is panya or wisdom. And so the text says, here the disciple is wise, he possesses wisdom regarding the arising and disappearance of things the rise and disappearance of phenomena. And this is the wisdom that is noble and penetrative. It penetrates the truth and it leads to the complete destruction of suffering. So this is the, you would say, the initial insight into the arising and passing away of phenomena. And that means the insight into what particular quality of phenomena. Exactly. The insight into anicca and permanence. Okay, so that wraps up how the noble disciple possesses seven good qualities. Maybe do we have any questions on anything covered so far? I was speaking too fast. Because it's complicated. Yeah, okay, let us put it this way. I, I'm a little puzzled by the relationship between energy and remembrance, but I take sati, I would take it more in the sense of the clear awareness of what is occurring in the present. You know, what we'd ordinarily mean by mindfulness in the meditative, uh, meditative practice. So we have the energy working together with mindfulness in the sense that one is attending mindfully to what is occurring you know, from moment to moment. And it's the energy that enables one to sustain that mindfulness. And then the mindfulness will also bring to mind, it will sort of expose unwholesome mental states when they arise. And so one could then make the effort to remove them and it will also expose good wholesome qualities that arise in the mind. And so one then makes the effort to preserve them and to strengthen them. And so what I say is just that when one is mindful of what is occurring in the present, that makes the mind more adept at remembering what is occurring so that one will have a better memory and be able to recollect what was happened a long time ago. Um, I think we have this mobile microphone. Mm -hmm. 
Could, could you explain how can you train it well? I mean, if that means gaining actual insight to practice, why can't it say penetrate the will by development or by practice? Wait, I'm, I'm not really hearing you clearly. Speak a little more loudly. Um, about the phrase penetrate the will by view, if that means gaining actual insight <coughs> through practice, why isn't it phrased as penetrating well by development or by practice, but instead just say by view. My problem is with the word by view. Yeah, the actual word used here in Pali is ditti, which sometimes it has the meaning of a sort of intellectual view, other times it means through actual insight. Um, I think this to be the actual actual insight. So it can be maybe taking more broadly, begin, maybe beginning with getting a clear conceptual understanding through investigation and then through practice going on to direct actual insight. So in that, if we take it in a second sense, then penetrating well by view is not something completely separate from the seventh factor of wisdom. You know, it's penetrating well by view, which means penetrating with wisdom. And the learning of the Dhamma comes to fulfillment with the practice of energy and mindfulness that culminates in wisdom. I think it's good if you take the microphone. Thank you. I'm doing this. So I'm having a little trouble um, accepting the distinction between intellectual insight and um, grasping a matter more deeply through what I think you're saying is experience. Yeah. I mean, to my way of thinking, yeah. um, the intellectual insight may or may not be more limited. The what? may or may not be more limited. You know, I, the, the sense I get from what you're saying, or what yeah. the, the, um, the text. you're saying is, or did you say Ananda? Yeah. Um, is that, that the actual incorporation of that insight, the physical experience incorporating that insight is better. And, and I, I'm questioning that. <laughs> Well, let us say that the actual experiential insight does represent a higher stage of development than just being able to understand into the principles intellectually. It's not in any way to um, devalue intellectual understanding, but in the systematic unfolding of the Buddha's teaching, one proceeds from learning to getting an intellectual grasp and then going from the intellectual grasp to a very you know, direct personal insight. So they, they are sequential in that way. Okay, so, oh, please, yeah. Um, is this energy done with the charming? Oh, yeah, you take the... Is this energy Dhamma Vichaya? Is it the same? Dhamma Vichaya. Dhamma Vichaya. Yeah, Dhamma Vichaya is investigation of the Dhamma, which seems to cover, from under the heading of learning, it seems to cover both the investigation with the mind and penetrating well by view. So energy itself, within the seven factors of enlightenment, this energy is actually the third factor of enlightenment, which is energy. Is this one of the ten perfection? Is this one of the ten perfection? Energy is also one of the ten perfections. Yeah. So energy, many of some of these factors, they they fit into a number of different uh, schemes of. of of principles of practice. 
It's just I'm trying to think of an analogy. Anyway, you could fit them into different schemes, like bricks fitting into different buildings. Same brick fitting into different buildings. Okay, so let's move on, because I want to finish the sutta today. Okay, so now we come to, this is the next stage of training. So how, this is, is going to be the achievement of the jhanas, which now we come into the stage of real samadhi, deep samadhi. So how is a noble disciple, one who obtains at will, without trouble or difficulty, the four jhanas that constitute the higher mind and provide a pleasant abiding or dwelling in happiness here and now? Okay, so now we're, this is going to be followed by the standard formula for the four jhanas. And so I'll go through it and sort of give a brief explanation. Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states of mind, the noble disciple enters and abides in the first jhana. Actually, to get the full formula, we should go to page 275. Paragraph 19. Well, let's go to 51, actually. Sutta 51. Okay, this is page 451. Okay, having Thus abandon these five hindrances, imperfections of the mind that weaken wisdom, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. These are the unwholesome states of mind that have to be removed to enter the first jhana. Usually they are explained as the five hindrances, sensual desire, ill will, mental dullness and drowsiness, restlessness and remorse and doubt. One enters and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. Okay, now, in entering the first jhana, the mind has arisen has emerged from the five hindrances and all distracting thoughts. It has become focused one-pointedly upon its object. Usually the object is called a nimitta. Often it takes the form of a kind of bright light to a bright, bright disk. And in the jhana, one has, according to the, what's mentioned in the suttas, on the table I have both the Sutta exposition and the Abhidhamma explanation. So in the Sutta we have a distinction of what is absent, what has been removed and what is present. So what is absent are sensual pleasures, unwholesome states of mind, and what is present are applied thought and sustained thought. Sometimes so I translate them now as thought and examination. But it's best to use the, or to refer to the actual Pali words, which have more precise meanings. The two words are vitaka and vichara. And just below the table there's some explanation of them. Vitaka, which is sometimes translated applied thought, initial thought, mental application, this is that mental factor that applies the mind to the object, that directs the mind to the object, or sometimes it's even said that it's the factor that mounts the mind on the object, that fixes the mind on the object. And then vichara, which is translated as sustained thought or as examination, 
It's not examination in the sense of looking at the object in order to understand it, but it means a kind of sustained attention to the object. And it's said to exercise a continued pressure on the object, or it has the function of keeping the mind anchored on the object. And so these two factors, vitaka, vichara, are both present simultaneously in the first jhana. So usually one uses vitaka to keep the mind on the object. So say, in our ordinary experience, trying to focus on the breath. We're breathing in, breathing out. And so that function, mental function of keeping the mind on the breath, you could say is the work, or applying the mind to the breath, is the work of vitaka. You know, the mind drifts, again we take the mind, we pull the mind back, apply it to the breath. That is vitaka. It's not so much conceptually or discursively thinking about the object, but applying the mind to the object, even with the simple thought, in-breath, out-breath, in-breath, out-breath. And then as that application becomes continuous, then vichara becomes more prominent, so that the mind is able to remain on the object. And that function that keeps the mind on the object is vichara. The commentaries give some similes to illustrate their relationship. The similes are not perfect, they have some faults. I like the one, the simile of the two hands which are being used to wash the dishes. With one hand, we hold the dish so that it doesn't fall away. And then with the other hand, we take the dish washing cloth or the sponge and we rub the dish. So the hand that holds the dish, this is like vitaka, which applies the mind to the object. And vichara is like the hand which rubs the object with the sponge. 